meal and we were hopefully going to try some different toppings to kind of experiment with our clients and see if we could get them introduced to other ways to add fiber to their diet. So during the first lesson we talked about fiber. Now if you remember, we added flaxseed, which was ground, and we added some chia seeds to our oatmeal. Now remember, fiber is really important. It does a lot of things for us. It helps push the food through our intestines. It helps us get rid of the stuff in our body that we don't want. So one of the things we need to remember when we add fiber, we have to add liquids. So anytime you put something like that in your client's food, make sure they drink. Now, some of the things that we can do with the chia seeds. I was asked this week about healthy lunches, and one of the examples was peanut butter and jelly. Now, peanut butter and jelly is actually not a bad lunch. It's usually the type of bread that's the issue. A lot of our clients like white bread, not a high fiber wheat bread. So something we can do when we're adding um, fiber to a client's diet, if they like that peanut butter and jelly sandwich, which in my opinion is always healthier than bologna or lunch meats, because lunch meat have a lot of added nitrates and things that sodium, some of them add salt, some of them add sugar. So peanut butter and jelly is actually not a bad sandwich. Again, it's the bread. What we could do to that sandwich if we don't have a client that wants to try a different type of bread, we can go ahead and sprinkle a little bit of that flaxseed, that ground flaxseed, and just a sprinkle of chia seeds on top of the peanut butter before we put like the jelly in there. And that would increase the fiber of that sandwich without them even knowing it's in there because you can't taste those things. Um, Chia seeds, again, you've got to get clearance from their doctor because of other issues. It's a seed and it might cause other problems, but ground flax seed, you can't taste, they won't see. Now, a better option instead of jelly would be honey. I don't know if your clients like honey, but honey actually has some really good natural properties that would be a good addition to a sandwich. Um, Last week, we talked about blood sugar, and I used the examples of my blood cell. We're going to do a close-up of my blood sugar blood cells example. We have healthy. Notice how the white blood cells move freely. So this is a healthy person, okay? This is somebody who doesn't control their blood sugar or eats too much sugar in their diet. Notice how the white cells don't flow like they should. When this happens, that's when we have a client that might have issues with neuropathy, which is the tingling of the fingers and the feet. It can also lead to amputation if we don't take care of ourselves. The nerves in your extremities get blood last. So if those nerves in your fingers and toes aren't getting blood, they get angry and it's very painful. So we want to control the blood sugar so that our blood looks more like this. If it looks like this and we have heart disease, if we have arteries that are narrowing and the blood can't get through, we have an increased chance of stroke and or heart attacks because we can't get the blood where it needs to go. The heart has to pump too hard. Now, the clients that come and exercise with me in my room have seen this before. But this is how much sugar is in one bottle of soda. All of this sugar is in one bottle of soda. So if we're trying to control blood sugar, this is not a good way to do it. It would be okay if we broke the bottle down into smaller parts. So if you don't really want to drink diet soda because of the artificial sweeteners. It's better to have a little bit of the real thing. So giving them just a small portion of it so that they're not getting so much at a time. And then again, like we just talked about in our class, combat it with some sort of protein. 
Um, it can be a piece of string cheese, it can be a five almonds, it can be a tablespoon of peanut butter, it can be a small piece of chicken, but something with protein. Something that some of you may or may not have ever heard of is called metabolic syndrome. And metabolic syndrome, for a health professional like myself, is kind of that silent killer. We don't know we have it until we go to the doctor and have our wellness exam. Now, what is metabolic syndrome? Metabolic syndrome means I have a waist circumference greater than 40 if I'm a man and greater than 35 inches if I'm a woman. My triglycerides is over 150. Now, some of you don't know what a triglyceride is, but triglyceride is actually fat that's in your blood. And the best way to lower your triglycerides is exercise because the fat in your blood gets burned up as energy when you work out, okay? The next marker, they call it, is HDL cholesterol. And it's gonna be less than 40 in men and less than 50 in women. Now, there are different types of cholesterol and we're gonna have a lesson on fat later on and I'll explain it more in detail. But HDL is what we call the happy, healthy cholesterol. That's the one we actually want to be higher. So if it's below that, your doctor's gonna mark that as, okay, that's another marker against you, okay? Another marker is blood pressure. So you don't want the number to be greater than 130 over 85. If you're in that category, the doctor's gonna put another check in the box, basically. So that's another marker. And then usually when you go to the doctor for a physical, they do a blood glucose. They make you fast and then they take your blood and they check for blood sugar, the glucose in your blood. If it's greater than 100, you get another check in the box. So if you have any of those five things, you have what's called metabolic syndrome. And what does that mean? That means that you have an increased risk of diabetes, you have an increased risk of heart disease. You have an increased risk of stroke. And exercise and a healthy diet can do the negative effects of all those. We can reverse them with healthy diet and an exercise. So it's really important that you listen to your staff and staff takes the extra measures to try to give our clients the best that we can, okay? Now, if we do have metabolic syndrome, what does that really mean? So I'm gonna kind of show you, and I'm gonna use, whoop, somebody's on there and needs to mute. <laughs> Let's just wait a second until they mute, us, mute it for us, okay? Zero point. 
So my metabolic rate, my basal metabolic rate is gonna be different than Allison's. And my metabolic rate is gonna be different than Jennifer. Jennifer is doing the videotaping for us today. Yay, Jennifer. Okay, so everybody's number is different. And I have it on the board here as R0. So that's our starting point. And again, everybody's different. Now, if I am the type of person that doesn't like to eat breakfast, because a lot of people have this misconception that if I skip meals, I'm gonna lose weight. I'm gonna show you with a very exaggerated example why that's not true. So let's say, I'm gonna pick on you, Allison. Let's say Allison gets up in the morning and she grabs a cup of black coffee and she gets in her car after she takes Ernie for a walk and she comes to work. And she gets tied up in meeting after meeting. So now it's noon and Allison has had nothing but a cup of black coffee. So here's Allison. I gotta get a different color here. Allison gets up and she's going along with her morning routine and she's not doing anything. Okay? So here's her zero. She gets up and she's down here. She's, she's coasting underneath the line. She doesn't know what she's doing. And then all of a sudden at lunchtime, she's like, man, I'm starving. I'm just going to run over to Chick-fil-A and grab something to eat. And she has a chicken sandwich with some french fries and ooh, let's have a shake because I haven't eaten all day and I'm starving. What happens to her blood sugar? It goes up because she ate something, right? But is it a really a healthy choice? Probably not. So her blood sugar, shortly after she eats that, goes down. And if this is her zero, she crashes and burns. So if you get that where you eat lunch and then all of a sudden you're like <sighs> snoozing, it's the crash and burn. Her blood sugar went, oh boy, we got food. And all of a sudden we're going, oh, I don't have any food left. So she goes along with her day and she's getting kind of cranky. And it's two o'clock and she's ready for a nap. So instead of taking a nap, she's like, oh, Snickers bar vending machine. Yay. And we do this again. What happens about 30 minutes after she eats that candy bar? Uh, comatose again, right? Well, now it's time to head home and she's got to get in her car and drive. So she gets home and she's like, I don't really want to cook. I've had a tough day. I'm so tired. I'm just going to throw a frozen pizza in the oven. Is frozen pizza a healthy choice? No. What happens to her blood sugar? Boom. And you know what happens to people that don't eat lunch? They go home and then they make that pizza and then it's pretty much fair game. We eat until we go to bed. So then she goes to bed and her blood sugar maybe goes down a little bit, but she keeps snacking. She has popcorn, probably has a beer with her popcorn and her blood sugar never really goes back down. Okay? That's one exaggerated example. What happens before I go on? So if breakfast is breaking the fast and Allison doesn't eat anything until noon, look at all of this missed opportunity for her to wrap her metabolism. So instead of burning more calories during those first six hours, She's really just sitting there. So when people don't eat and they think they're saving calories, if you don't turn the metabolism on, your body actually, as a defense mechanism, starts throwing stuff out there saying, oh my gosh, we're starving. We got to hold on to all that fat because we don't know when we're going to get fed next. So we're actually making it worse, okay? So she misses out on all of that calorie burning potential, we'll call it, okay? Now, where's my rag? In case I need to make a little room here. 
I don't want to race it all. So we're going to put her back down here and see that. Okay. Now, Michael doesn't know this, but he actually volunteered to be my example for this one. Michael gets up at six o'clock and instead of having no breakfast, he eats a donut. What do you guys think is going to happen to Michael's blood sugar? If he starts here and he has his donut, crash and burn. Well then at 10 o'clock when it's break time and the clients are eating snack, he's like, man, I'm starving. I should have something. So he runs to the vending machine and gets a Coke to wake him up. Okay? And then after he has the Coke, he's busy with the clients and it's lunchtime. And all of a sudden, okay, well, I'm going to have a frozen pizza or a microwavable meal. And he throws that in. Well, now it's two o'clock and he's still hungry. So he's like, Allison, I'm gonna go to the vending machine. I'm gonna get myself a Snickers bar. They have nuts in, that's healthy, right? And then he gets home and he doesn't wanna cook dinner for his wife. So he also goes down to the freezer and he gets a prepackaged like TV dinner. Okay. So a completely different example, but by not giving his body the right types of foods, look at all the times during his day where instead of revving the engine, we call it, he dips below because again, his body's going, whoa, wait a minute, I don't have any fuel left, what am I gonna do? So his metabolism kind of slows down because it's saving those calories for a later time. Okay, now I'm going to use me for the last example. You've got to find a color that you can see. I don't know if the red one works. All right, so Lynn is going to be the next example because this is how I spend my day with my calories, okay? I get up in the morning and I have my black cup of coffee and I walk my dog and I work out and then I have breakfast. And my breakfast is usually a really high vegetable made quiche or it's oatmeal, okay? So what's gonna happen to my blood sugar when I get up? I have my cup of coffee, I work out, and then I eat breakfast. Now, I don't get to eat snack because snack time for me at 10 o'clock is when I get to work. But I eat fairly late breakfast but I eat such a good breakfast, my blood sugar stays pretty level. And then at lunchtime, clients always ask me what I eat. A lot of times it's overnight oatmeal, sometimes it's chia pudding, sometimes it's salad with chicken, sometimes it's leftover stir fry. I just, whatever I have, sweet potato burgers, whatever. But whatever I bring is balanced. And my blood sugar will do this. Then I go home and I have a new puppy. I have a rescue puppy. So I take my dog Metallica out and then I have a snack. And my snack is usually something protein. I either have a protein shake with veggies. I have some celery with sunflower butter. Sometimes I have a bowl of cereal with fruit because I'm, I usually work out again after I get home. That's what I do. And then dinner time. Dinner time for us is usually mostly vegetables with protein. I tend to eat my carbs earlier in the day. And the reason I do that is because you're more active during the day and carbs are the first source of energy for your body. So carbs are the last thing you should eat before you go to bed because carbs that don't get used for energy get stored as fat. So our dinner is usually Chicken with vegetables, fish with vegetables, beef with vegetables. And when I say vegetables, I'm not talking corn, I'm not talking peas, 
I am not talking mixed vegetables because there's a lot of starchy vegetables in them. I'm talking salads. I'm talking about stir fries made with like zucchini, peppers, onions, broccoli, cauliflower, all really high water-based veggies, okay? So when I eat that for dinner, what is my blood sugar? It does this. If I'm really hungry and it's late and I'm, I'm ready for bed, I'll sometimes have a glass of milk just to kind of stabilize my blood sugar till morning. Notice the difference. If this is my zero, right through here, notice by eating like I do, if that's zero, how my metabolism is elevated all day, even when I'm sitting in a chair, which I hardly ever do. If anybody knows me, I move all the time. I'm either dancing or swaying. I hardly ever sit still. And we're gonna talk about that in another cooking lesson another time. But all day long, I have what I call the fire in the furnace. Okay, so what we're trying to do, all of us, is to try to find that healthy relationship with food and understand how when we put different foods together, it actually helps us get leaner, not necessarily lighter. You'll hear people say, well, muscle weighs more than fat. Okay, so we're trying to get our clients to get leaner, not necessarily lighter. We talked about how a pound of fat and a pound of muscle weigh a pound. There is no weight difference between the two. But if we can eat healthier and increase activity, this is two pounds of fat versus two pounds of muscle. We want the muscle, we don't want the fat. So by making some interesting and creative choices with our clients, we can get them leaner not necessarily lighter. We want a healthier version of ourselves. I've heard it so many times. A pound is a pound. If you put a pound on a scale of muscle versus fat, this is two pounds of butter. So two pounds of butter, a two pound weight. Which weighs more? They weigh the same. Which takes up more space? This. So when people ask me, well, am I losing weight? My answer usually is, I don't want you to get, I don't want you to lose weight. I want you to get leaner. Because leaner helps us prevent metabolic syndrome. It helps prevent other diseases, but our, our size gets smaller, even if the scale doesn't change. I taught a nutrition class for a hospital for almost nine years. And I, would t I taught a class that was 12 weeks long. And one of the gals that took my class was really frustrated because she only lost, in that 12 week period of time, she only lost two pounds. And every week she would say, hey, I'm still not losing, it's okay. We did measurements before and after. And she only lost two pounds of fat, but she lost nine inches in her waist. Do you think her clothes fit better? Absolutely. So when clients are looking to lose weight, we need to really focus on not losing the muscle. Muscle is our metabolism. So all day long, we're burning calories. So I'm trying really hard to encourage the clients to do strength training. It's always their choice, but I made a, a circuit workout in our gym where we do wall push-ups, we do snow angels, we do TikToks. When they come to the fitness room, I have them do chair squats, and these workouts are on our YouTube page, so if you need to reference those, they're out there. But the reason we wanna strength train is because muscle is the fire in the furnace. And it helps us burn those extra calories all day. It helps us keep our blood sugar under control, okay? Now, a great example of 
this example on the board is a piggy bank. I got a piggy bank here. Another way to look at our day is that we each have a cash box of calories. Now, some of us have maybe 2,500 pennies in our little piggy bank to spend during the day. So what we wanna do is we wanna make good choices throughout the day. And the example I used was a healthy breakfast and it can be a piece of toast with peanut butter. A healthy snack could be a piece of string cheese and an orange or some applesauce. Lunch can be some chicken with some lettuce as a wrap and maybe a side of some carrot sticks or some sliced fruit. The afternoon snack could be maybe some pretzels with some peanut butter or um, some hummus with some veggies. If you've never tried hummus, hummus is a great source of protein. And then dinner should be a protein with lots of vegetables. We wanna fill up our clients with those vegetables. Great way to add fiber and nutrients to our diet. Spend your calories wisely. Now, if you're like me, I'm pretty frugal with my calories, but I like to disperse them evenly throughout the day. I did send an example of some healthy snacks to Montana the other day, and the reason I did that is because that's how I eat. I really eat snacks five, six times a day. And the secret for blood sugar control, for those of us that are diabetic, but those of us that have the start of metabolic syndrome, this is how we need to eat. If, for example, I'm going to have a banana, I need to pair that banana with a lean protein, whether it's a tablespoon of peanut butter or a piece of string cheese. Because if I don't, if I eat just the banana, my blood sugar does this. If I eat just applesauce, my blood sugar does this. So if your clients are bringing snacks, you really need to pay attention to, to pairing that fruit or that vegetable with the protein because that's how you stabilize and level off that blood sugar. Metabolic syndrome is basically when I eat too much sugar if I drink those 21 teaspoons of sugar in my soda and I don't have anything else with it, that crash and burn is why your, your pancreas is sending out all that insulin to combat that sugar and your pancreas just wears out. So metabolic syndrome is basically making a lot of bad choices and your body's going, I give up, I'm not doing this anymore and next thing you know you have diabetes. So we have some control over that, but we also have to help our clients make those choices. If you send them an apple, send them a protein. When you're packing their lunch, if they're eating nothing but carbs, they're gonna be hungry right away, and they're gonna be unsatisfied. So we need to send them something with protein in it to help stabilize that blood sugar so they feel good. Some of our behaviors might happen because they're hungry and they're, they don't know how to communicate that. So we gotta help give them the tools so that they can be successful at this. Somebody's online again. Um, trying to think if I've missed anything. I would let them know to turn their mic on. Somebody turn their mic on and you need to turn it back off. Not sure who it is. Can somebody check and make sure your mic is off? There we go. Perfect. Somebody's still on. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to share that I, I, I posted those there. I do have some other handouts, but I'm not sure. I don't trust myself to do it, so I'll just send them to Allison and she can make sure that everybody gets a copy of okay. some of the, the stuff that we talked about today. Um, trying to think of anything else related to metabolism. Oh, this is probably something that most of you don't know. 
So those of you that don't do strength training, how important it is. Now, when we cook the buffalo chicken, the lesson of the day is gonna be about protein. So we're gonna cover protein next week. But a lot of us didn't maybe know that after the age of 35, our body loses up to 3% of its muscle mass every year, just in natural atrophy. So if we don't strength train, Eventually, that's where we get to the point where we can't get out of the chair. We can't carry the groceries in from the car. We can't get out of bed because our muscles are going away. So strength training not only is the fire in the furnace, but it's also, we got to combat the, combat the loss. If you know somebody that has been bedridden in the hospital, how quickly they get weak. It takes twice as long to gain the muscle as it does to lose it. That's why they lose their muscle so fast. So we've really got to do a good job of doing some exercises with our clients that help keep them strong. A lot of you requested the exercise kits and you received a, um, a resistance band and a simple ball, a ball for kids that we can do lots of exercises with. I also did laminating of the circuit workout that we have posted in our gym. Anything that you can get your clients to do to keep the muscle vibrant and healthy and going. So if you are over 35, if I haven't convinced you now to do your strength training and it doesn't have to be, I got to join a gym. You can go onto our YouTube page and find the workouts. The workouts I have, I can send them to everybody. I made them during the shutdown where everybody was at home so we could do exercises with our clients. Our staff needs to do exercises. There isn't anybody out there that shouldn't be exercising, okay? It is crucial to your improved quality of life. All right, I'm gonna have you guys go ahead and unmute and see if anybody has any questions. Okay. Anybody have any questions? Jennifer? Oh, very interesting. I learned a lot. Cool. Thank you. I'm 35 now. That's very interesting to learn that. Yes. Work out. And the older you get, the harder you have to work. I'm sorry, but that's true. I work harder now than I did when I was 18. But I refuse to lose, let's say. <laughs> the question I see is, do you recommend keto diets? The answer is no. What we're trying to do with a keto diet is force our body into ketosis. And by doing that, that's exactly what every doctor in this country that works with diabetics is trying to avoid. So keto diets is actually forcing your body to do something that it's not supposed to do. The best diet out there that they recommend is the Mediterranean diet, which is a plant-based diet. A lot of people are so focused on losing weight, what you really need to focus is on healthy eating plans, Worrying about where your metabolism is as far as controlling your blood sugar. But you also have to look at, okay, if I want to lose weight and I lose a pound, but I didn't change the behavior that led to that weight gain, I can lose and gain that same pound over and over again and not really ever get to the root of the problem. So putting your body in a risky state of ketosis Versus, okay, why, why do I need to lose weight? Well, it might be just simply, wow, now Lynn showed me, I've got to eat five, six times a day. i got to eat a protein with a piece of fruit or a healthy vegetable at every meal. That's really as simple as it is. And whether or not that makes you go into ketosis, I don't know, but I don't recommend it. That's a long-winded answer, but hopefully it answered your question.
I, I again wouldn't recommend it because again, you're, you're telling your body to do something it's not supposed to do. So when you think back to the days where the hunters and gatherers, they would have to store their fat until the men of the tribe went out and got a buffalo and then they would feast. So yeah, they probably stayed lean, but they had to store all that fat until they got the next meal. We live in a state now where food is in abundance. We can go to McDonald's and get something for a buck. So we choose convenience. We're usually not in that state where we're starving. There are people out there, yes, that are. But most of us have it available to us, especially our clients. We make sure they eat. We do. That's our job. So fasting is not the means to get to the problem. Again, if, if you're trying to get leaner, not necessarily lighter, you got to focus on the behaviors. And it might be just simply adding breakfast, adding a healthy lunch, adding a healthy snack, and adding some strength training. It can be just simple little steps. Pick one thing at a time so it's not so overwhelming. Anybody else? You can always get fiber through food. I would not recommend taking a supplement. We talked about it during the oatmeal lab. I worked as a chemist for seven years. And one of the raw materials that I used to test was called methyl cellulose, which is essentially the same thing that's in like fiber one. When you put fiber one in a jar and you add water to it, it swells up like jelly, which is essentially the same thing that the chia seeds are doing. They swell up like jelly. So once those chia seeds get in your system and they're swelled up, they're doing the same thing as the, the methyl cellulose, but the chia seeds actually have a nutritional value. So if you want to add fiber to your food, just try simply sprinkling a little chia seed in your yogurt. You can put it in your cereal. You can sprinkle it on your sandwich. But then you're at least you're getting nutrients instead of basically cellulose, which has no nutritional value. Okay. Does that mean you have a question? I do have a question. Jennifer has a question, so hang on. What about um, getting protein um, quickly from like canned chicken and stuff like that? Is that okay or should we avoid that? Her question is, should we eat anything like canned chicken or stuff like that? The problem with anything in a can is sodium. So what we're gonna learn next week is how to make crock pot shredded chicken. And then we're gonna learn lots of different recipes that we can make from that. So what I do every weekend is I do a food prep day, whether it's Saturday or Sunday. And every weekend I make a crock pot full of chicken. And then I put it in smaller containers in the freezer. So if I don't bring my oatmeal for lunch, all I do is I pull a little jar of chicken out of my freezer. By the time it's lunchtime, it's thawed out enough for me to eat it. I don't eat bread and that's only because I have to eat gluten-free because I have celiac and I can't find a bread that doesn't fall to pieces when I make a sandwich. So I never bring a sandwich just because it's too messy. So I bring the chicken, but then I also bring avocado mayonnaise, which we're gonna learn about that when we make the buffalo chicken. It has half the fat, but it has good fats. So all I do is bring chicken with a little bit of mayonnaise on top of it. And then sometimes I put it inside of a, a lettuce leaf and make a wrap out of a piece of lettuce. Somebody had a question and it went away and now I don't know where to find it. And Claire asked, how do you feel about frozen fruit and vegetables? Frozen fruit and vegetables. Okay, so we talked about that last week. Fresh is best, then frozen, then canned, then dried. That's the order. And if you're gonna do canned, make sure it's not in oil, Make sure it's in water. Make sure it's not in syrup. So frozen is actually healthier sometimes than fresh because when they freeze like a blueberry, it isn't sitting under the lights in the store. After it sits out for a certain period of time, it's just gonna lose some of its nutrients versus when they 
when they freeze it, they pick it and they basically freeze it right away. So sometimes frozen is actually healthiest. Depends on the time of year. I love frozen blueberries. That's my favorite snack. That's dessert to me. Yep. <laughs> Makes your lips and your teeth turn blue, but then you just brush your teeth. It's, it's easy. Any other questions? These are great questions. Thanks, everybody. I should buy frozen grapes. Yeah, I'm not a huge grape person just because I don't like the texture of whatever they spray on them. And I've tried organic and they still, I'd rather have a glass of wine. I'm just gonna be honest. <laughs> it's still a grape. <laughs> Anybody else? So I, I, I'm always open to suggestions or questions. Just send me an email. If you need more ideas on things to, you know, try to encourage your clients to either try or buy, hopefully these cooking slash nutrition classes are going to help educate everybody because my goal as a health and fitness professional is for everybody to try to be their healthiest because we only get one chance to get it right. We got to do our best every day to be the best possible human that we can be and the healthiest and the happiest. That's, that's our goal, everybody's goal. So next week we're gonna make buffalo chicken, all right? Let's pray for no more snowstorms so we can get to the store. So thanks for joining everybody. Have a great Friday and a happy, safe weekend, okay? Thank you, Lynn. Bye everybody.